So, you've probably heard that the social media app called TikTok has been banned by the United States government. The ban is yet to take official effect, and the whole thing is honestly pretty complicated. The reason most sources have cited it is because the app is Chinese designed and has been implicated with various breaches of privacy and illegal collection of data. This whole thing is basically a proxy cyber war between paranoid fractions if you ask me. But honestly, it doesn't even matter. Now, as rewarding and constructive as it can be to discuss politics on the internet with strangers, I'd rather not go down that path right now. It's not the real reason it got banned anyway. I am. At least I think I am. I imagine half of you right now probably hate me already, but please, just hear me out. Feel free to lambast and or praise me in the comments if you wish, but I'm not here to make myself famous or gain any sort of clout. I'm here because something truly horrifying happened and the world deserves to know the truth. I was an avid user of TikTok, regularly wasting hours just browsing random videos and periodically making my own. My lawyer has recommended not sharing my username for reasons that will become evident soon enough, so sorry in advance. I had a modest following, but nothing crazy. Most of my videos involved me doing dumb little skits or filming my cats doing something funny. Never had anything big, and by all accounts, it was nothing out of the ordinary. I lived with my parents, and one night I was home alone playing some Apex Legends when my bedroom door just suddenly shut. It made me jump, and I turned around to see what happened. I fully anticipated seeing my brother or another family member with a smug grin, but no one was there. I got eliminated shortly after and got up to check the house, still a bit unnerved. My parents were away for the weekend visiting my grandma, and my brother was supposed to be staying the night at a friend's house. I figured he must have come home instead, but after searching the house and calling his name, I didn't find him. I figured he was hiding to try and scare me, because that asshole loves to make me jump and it's not very difficult. I finally decided to call him, only to find out he was in fact still at his friend's house. I felt chills slither down my spine when he sent me a selfie of himself to prove it. I thought about calling the police, thinking that someone had broken in, but there were no signs of that being the case. Now, they sent the movies, and I knew immediately that my door wouldn't have shut on its own due to a random gust of wind or some draft inside the house. I was on edge the rest of that night, but nothing else happened. A few days later, however, I was lying in bed at around 2am when I heard something whisper my name. I shot up right away, but saw nothing in my room. It sounded like it came from my closet, but when I flicked the lights on, there was nothing there. I began to grow seriously unnerved by that point, and just sat around with my heart racing for a couple of minutes. Just when I had finally calmed down, I was about to turn the lights back off. A cup suddenly fell from the dresser. Water splashed all over the ground, but I barely noticed. A rational part of my mind wondered whether a random tremor from the earth was responsible, but that thought ceased with a single noise. Knock. A sudden, muffled knock reverberated from somewhere in my room. By this point, I was really beginning to panic, and I was about two seconds away from sprinting out of my room and screaming like a banshee. I don't exactly know what stopped me from doing that, to be honest. Is someone there? I don't know why I asked the question either, but to my surprise, knock. My heart skipped a beat, and I tried to determine where exactly the knock was coming from. Like before, I thought maybe my brother was messing with me, but it was past midnight and I knew he had to work the next day. Curiosity then mixed with horror and I formulated an idea. I pulled out my phone and began recording. Can you hear me? I could hear my own voice shaking as I spoke. Knock. A cold chill swept down my spine, but an idea struck. One knock for yes and two for no, okay? Knock. To ensure it understood, I decided to ask a question to see if it would actually respond correctly. Are you a giant purple elephant? Knock, knock. The knock seemed to change location every time even with the two consecutive knocks. 
I ended the video and shared it with a the tagline. There is something in my room. Holy crap. I then started another video and posed another question. Are you here to hurt me? Knock, knock. My heart breathed a small sigh of relief at that. I shared that video too, and then did a quick check through my house to make damn sure that one of my family members wasn't just messing with me. After confirming that, I went back to my room, now more curious than afraid. I thought I could be the very first person to document paranormal phenomenon firsthand, and that possibility really excited me. Are you still there? Knock. My heart jumped with enthusiasm as the camera rolled. I asked a few more yes-no questions, but most were just simple things that aren't too relevant. After the thing continued to respond accurately, I decided to take things to another level and prove once and for all that I wasn't just being pranked. Can you do something to demonstrate you're here? This was probably a bad idea, and I'm sure I'll get scolded in the comments for it, but I had to know. There was no knock this time, and things just lingered in silence for a couple of seconds. A sudden creaking noise then echoed from my right, and I turned in sheer disbelief to see my doorknob begin to turn. The door popped and slowly rolled open to touch the opposite wall at the foot of my bed. There was no one outside. I shared the video. I was still nervous, but now also giddy with excitement. I thought my discovery of the apparent poltergeist in my room may shock not only the TikTok community, but the world at large. We've all seen those supposed paranormal videos on YouTube and whatnot, of a door slowly opening, or some vague, shadowy figure that appears for a few frames, but this was on a whole new level. Not only was the entity willfully engaging my questions, but it was happening right before my eyes. I probably recorded a dozen more videos that night with various captions. I can tell you the exact amount, but all of them had since been deleted along with my account. That was my lawyer's suggestion, and I think he's right. Maybe someone out there archived them, but I hope not. I hope those videos never see the light of day again. Over the next couple days, I continued to communicate with the presence in my room. I contemplated getting a Ouija board to try and ask some better questions, but I knew my staunchy religious parents would probably castrate me if they ever caught me with something like that. Instead, I decided to construct one out of paper, using a Pringles lid as a planchette. I didn't really think anything would happen, but decided to go for it anyway. I had read that you need at least three people to make a Ouija board work, something about a certain amount of spiritual energy or something. My good friend Ethan had seen most of my videos and was really interested in what was going on. I invited him to come over and see for himself, and he was more than happy to accept. He arrived late one night, and I explained to him what my plan was. Ethan needed very little convincing and was game basically from the get-go. Ethan and I went to Jake, my older brother's room, and tried to explain to him what I was doing. He clearly didn't believe me when I claimed I had made contact with something supernatural, but he also swore up and down that he had nothing to do with it. After a bit, I finally managed to convince him to come join us. His eyes went wide when he beheld my crude Ouija board. Zack, what the hell are you doing? He asked, looking suddenly uncomfortable. Jake, there's something in here, I swear. Watch. I looked around the room and took a deep breath. Can you hear me? Knock. The reaction came immediately and made Jake jump. Ethan giggled and gave a muffled hoot of excitement, but Jake was silent. He glanced around the room, trying to see where it came from as his visible discomfort grew. See, I told you, I proclaimed. I sat down beside the paperboard and motioned for both of them to join me. Ethan sat down right away, but Jake hesitated. He looked around the room once more and then sighed, taking a seat opposite to me. Do you want to talk? I asked to our ethereal guest. Knock. Ethan had a wide smile, but Jake remained stoic. 
I put my hand on my Pringles cap planchette, and Ethan did the same soon after. Both of us then looked at Jake, who eyed us both warily. He clearly wasn't comfortable with it, but the sight of my ragtag Ouija board clearly amused him. Really? I shrugged. Mom would kill me if I got a real one. Jake just sighed, not looking excited in the least, but placed his fingers in the cap as well. There was a moment of silence between the three of us, but surprisingly, Jake then asked the first question. Can you hear us? Nothing happened for a moment, but then I felt the planchette seem to try and pull away. Our hand stayed gently on it as it hovered to the Y on the board. It paused a moment, then I felt it pull towards the E. Sure enough, a second later and it fell on S. Ethan immediately retracted his hand from the board and put his hands to his head. You guys better not be messing with me, he said. Dude, I swear on my life I'm not doing it, I replied. Ethan shook his head and Jake just remained silent as if he didn't know what to say. I could tell both of them were hesitant to continue, so I decided to reassure them. Don't worry guys, it means us no harm. Watch, you don't want to hurt us, right? I motioned for them to put their hands back, and after a few seconds, they both did. The Pringles cap then slowly drifted towards N, and then to O. We shouldn't be doing this, Jake said. Dude, we're going to go viral for this, no question. You're still recording, right? Ethan replied, looking to me. I nodded and stopped the video to prepare the next one. Who cares? It ain't worth being haunted by a damn demon, Jake countered. He had a point, but I wasn't ready to back down. Are you a demon? I asked. N. O. C? Jake just glared at me like I was an idiot. Well, it's not going to admit it. That's like asking someone if they're a murderer. Of course they're going to say no. I guess he did have a point, but I was adamant that the presence was not malicious. Are you human? I asked. The planchette began to slide once more. N. O. Chills descended my spine after that. Jake and Ethan were both silent. My curiosity was insatiable by that point. What's your name? I asked. O. S. Y. R. A. I just looked at Jake and he hunched his shoulders. I stopped the recording on my phone, uploaded the video with a tag and started a new one. What are you? Jake asked. N. O. Why are you here? Ethan chimed in. Why? Oh. Jake immediately flung his hands off the planchette after the planchette drifted to the letter U. Nope, uh-uh, I'm done. Screw this. He began to leave the room. Dude, what's wrong? This is how, like, every horror movie ever made begins, Zack. I'm not about to be murdered by a ghost. As Jake and I argued, my bedroom door suddenly shifted. The three of us then watched in sheer disbelief as the door slowly rolled shut on its own accord. A dense moment of silence befell then, and Jake slowly turned to face me in horror. Honestly, we probably should have had the door closed from the beginning, but that message was received loud and clear. We weren't done until it said we were done. I guess we don't have a choice now, I said. Jake glared at me as he took his seat once more, gingerly reaching for the planchette, and posing another question. What do you want? L. O. V. E. I breathed a small sigh of relief at that. See, dude? He just wants to be loved. Probably just the ghost of someone that's lost or something. I don't know if I was trying to convince Jake or myself of that, but a sudden bang against the wall caused us all to jump. It was louder than any of the previous knocks, and it caused my heart to soar in my chest. This thing clearly had some kind of power to affect the physical world, and that should have terrified me way more than it did. Our hands returned to the planchette, and when it spelled something out, I actually chuckled. S. H. E. 
Oh, she... she's a girl. Sorry about that. I replied to her, shooting Jake a pensive smile. I guess even ghosts don't like being misgendered, Ethan said with a chuckle, and Jake just shook his head in response. Are you hot? Ethan just blurted out the question. Jake just glared at him like he actually wanted to smack him upside the head, and honestly, I felt the same. It was definitely not a wise decision to ask a powerful spirit. Yet despite that, it actually got an interesting response. C. O. L. D. Cold. Our conversation went on for a while and spanned multiple videos. Jake, Ethan and I just basically spitball questions at her, ranging from asinine things like hair colour to more profound questions like life after death. I'll just summarise a few of them now to save some time for us all. How old are you? Old. Where do you come from? No. Have you been here for long? Too long. Are you an alien? No. Is there life after death? No death. Are there more like you? Tupu. Is there something we can do to help you? Yes. What is it? Paravutal. What does that mean? That was the last question she responded to. We asked several more questions, but the planchette didn't move again. I figured that meant it was the end of the conversation. Jake stared at the board for several minutes before abruptly rising and opening my bedroom door to leave. Ethan and I just stared at the board in silence for a few minutes. For some reason, I was suddenly exhausted. I mean, it was the middle of the night by that point, but prior to our little game, I was wide awake. I work nights too, so I'm used to being up all night, but my lethargy made me wonder whether the exchange had taken a toll on my emotions or something. Ethan seemed to feel similar and announced not long after that he was going to head home. I bid him goodbye and locked the door behind him. I went to check on Jake, but he was already fast asleep in bed. Still feeling completely exhausted, I returned to my room. I didn't even have time to find something to watch on Netflix before falling asleep. That same night, I had probably the most visceral and disturbing nightmare of my entire life. I don't even normally have bad dreams, and if I do, I don't remember them. But I don't think I'll ever forget this one. I was in the forest, stumbling around in the dark. It wasn't like my normal dreams where random stuff seems to happen and have no control over anything. I was perfectly lucid. I remember touching the rough bark on the trees and feeling the velvety leaves as they swayed in the breeze. I walked onward, fully aware of who I was, but without a clue as to where I was or how I got there. The further I went, the more twisted the terrain became. The trees grew in odd, unnatural angles, spiraling like loop-de-loops and other ornate structures. The ground became riddled with holes that seemed to just be empty voids, with some of them being massive craters of replete oblivion. There were these weird and terrifying statues along the way. Large, matte grey slabs depicting all sorts of vile things. Some looked slightly human, most did not. The majority were some horrendous amalgamations of vaguely animalistic parts grated onto a wretched torso. Words simply cannot describe their utterly hideous vestiges in the context necessary nor can they convey the permeating dread that coagulated in my soul as I beheld them. It was like some deep fear within me had been awakened after seeing those sculptures. After some time, I came to a chasm. Before me sat a massive crater that contained a black darker than anything I'd ever seen before, at least at first. The more I stared at the abyss, the more I saw it for what it was. There was something down there, and I was unable to avert my gaze. I was paralysed in simultaneous bewilderment and unrelenting terror as something began to rise from the pit. Something new. Something old but new. Horrific and beautiful. A girl cloaked in tapestries of night, spewing forth a miasma of appendages that coiled and slithered into countless worlds. Below her, minions of every creed, colour, species and existence, festered and writhed about in chaotic ecstasy. 
They howled and cheered as their blasphemous goddess consumed the world, snuffing them into non-existence in their orgy of psychotic bliss. The ultimate contradictions portrayed in that revolting scene were enough to shake my mind to its roots, like simply witnessing it was a sin greater than any I'd ever committed. It was also wrong, but right in a way I myself cannot even explain. I don't even know if anything I've said here makes any sense to anyone, but I felt compelled to tell it anyway. It's like my hands have ceased to be their own and some other force is compelling them as though I were nothing more than a mere flesh puppet. I then felt a gaze shift to mine, and as soon as I was sure I was set to be devoured whole, everything vanished. Next thing I know, I'm waking up, gasping for breath in my bed. My shirt and sheets were soaked with cold sweat, and my heart was thundering in my chest. I've had bad dreams before, but nothing so visceral or horrifically profound as that one. It took me several minutes to realize I was back in the waking world, and a brief tranquility rolled over me. As terrifying as that dream was, it was only just a dream. The rational part of me tried desperately to explain away the madness that had just accosted my subconscious, and it almost succeeded. Until I saw the symbol in my closet. It looked like a circle with thorns jutting out of it, like some scribbling made by a child. It was not gently crafted. On the contrary, it appeared hastily scrawled as though inscribed by a deranged man on the last threads of fraying sanity. I rubbed my fingers along it, but it did not smudge nor leave residue on my finger. It looked almost like it had been burned into the wall. I decided then that I had to know more about what we had learned from the entity we had communed with. I searched the name it had gave us, Osira, but found very little that seemed relevant. It brought up a game I'm unfamiliar with called Pillars of Entity, but it wasn't a direct match. I also got results for a Polish soccer player, some town in Norway, and an electronic musician on Amazon Music. None of them seemed to match. So, I googled the word she had told us, which I did not recognize. Tupu, as far as I can tell, is a Swahili word which means empty, while Paravutal is to meal for spread or disperse. The fact it knew different languages was not that surprising, but the implications were. Tamil is one of the oldest known written languages in the world, predating Aromatic and Latin by a substantial margin. I'm no expert, but as far as I know, it's also a dead language like the other two. Can't imagine there's a whole lot of people that are fluent in it, which leads me to believe that whoever or whatever Osira is, she is very old. Both of my cats, Truffles and Lemmy, also began to refuse to enter my room. Truffles especially used to regularly sleep on my bed, but he had suddenly stopped even coming near my room. A couple times, I saw him staring from down the hall, with his ears pinned back and eyes like saucers. I tried carrying him to my room, but before I even got close, he went absolutely ballistic. He began snarling and hissing like he was in a battle for his life, and I dropped him after he shredded my arms with his claws. He bolted down the hall as soon as his paws touched the ground, and he hasn't ventured back upstairs since. My plausible deniability continued to dwindle the more I learned and pondered upon it. Even if both Jake and Ethan had played along and moved the planchette to prank me, I couldn't explain the knocks. To be honest, I'd long since abandoned the notion that either Jake or Ethan were playing me, and that was before I made another, truly unnerving discovery. By this point, the series of videos that I'd shared on TikTok had started to garner a bit of buzz. Several of them had a couple hundred likes and dozens of comments. It was the usual stuff you see on paranormal videos, with people claiming it's fake, while others offered advice or tried to explain what was happening. Most people just made meme references though, or told me to burn down the house. There was one that stood out from the rest though. Some girl I didn't know had commented under the video with four simple words that made my spine tingle. I've seen her too. I clicked on a profile, and like mine, it was nothing special. Just videos of her dancing and doing lip sync videos and stuff. 
She had more followers than I did, but nothing that would be considered influencer status. Her latest couple videos drew my attention right away. The first one was much like my first experience. The video showed her in what I assume was a bedroom asking questions and receiving knocks back just like I had. It was captioned something like, Ong, something is in my house. Her next video gave a bit more context. The first thing it showed was her, and she looked like she had been crying. She went on to explain that she had seen a video on TikTok of three guys using a ghetto Ouija board to speak to something called Osira. I knew immediately she was referring to my video. She then actually began to cry, and muttered something about thinking, it was now in her house too. I always thought the saying, may my blood run cold was cliche and overdramatic, but that was the first time I experienced it first hand. I would have sworn someone had just thrown me overboard the Arctic Express when I heard her say those words. The next video didn't help either. First thing I saw was that same symbol on a wall that had been branded in my closet. Hers was much larger, probably five feet wide at least. Now, she could have been a copycat after all. TikTok is known for copying trends and those various internet challenges, but something about her demeanor didn't mesh with that idea. Either she was a brilliant actress, or she was truly petrified. The video just showed her filming the symbol while muttering and softly crying, but the end was truly horrifying. A sudden knock caused her to swivel to the left. A door slowly rolled open, and in the darkness, there was quite clearly a shadowy silhouette looming in the doorway. The poor girl went absolutely ballistic, screaming and crying as the video degraded into a flurry of imagery before suddenly ending. Those first three videos were scary enough, but I think it's the last one which really rattled me to the core. The girl started the video filming herself, her expression completely deadpan and emotionless. She just sat in the darkness and stared at the camera, silent and unblinking for several seconds. I'm ready. The video then abruptly ended, and that was the last thing posted to her account. I don't know what she meant by that. Many people in the comments reacted similarly to how others had to my video. Once again though, another comment caught my eye. I've seen her too. I clicked on that profile, and found it was the account of some kid. He couldn't have been older than 12, but once again, he too had a similar strain of videos. I started watching the last one, when a sudden text message rolled in from a number I didn't have in my phone. Hi Zach, this is Ethan's mom. I was just wondering if you heard from Ethan lately. He said he was over at your house last night, and he didn't come home or text. Just wanted to make sure you guys are okay. Hope you're good. Once again, my heart plummeted to the lowest possible depths in my chest as I read those words. I dialed Ethan, but he didn't answer. I tried that three more times while checking all of his social media accounts. There was no activity on any of them, and he never answered my call. I began to seriously freak the hell out at that point and ran from my room to check on Jake. Jake, Jake, wake up man, we need to talk, I said, barging into his dark room. I thought I saw him still sleeping in bed, but as I tore the covers away, I realised it was empty. I thought maybe he had already left. But as I turned to walk out, I saw eyes staring at me from the closet. My heart skipped a beat and I stumbled back into the wall as I slumped down. My heart was soaring in my chest and it took several seconds for me to realise. He was just sitting in his closet, staring vacantly, completely unreactive to my sudden intrusion. I was partially relieved, but as I tried talking to him, I couldn't get him to respond. I grew angry, shouted and shook him, but he didn't react at all. He was completely catatonic, like he was in some kind of trance. He didn't even blink. Nothing I did could shake him from whatever state he was in. No matter how hard I shook him, pinched him or even slapped him, he wouldn't respond. Now realising that something was very, very wrong, I ran downstairs to my mother on the verge of a complete mental breakdown. 
I tried desperately to explain everything that had happened, but I probably didn't make a whole lot of sense. She finally seemed to clue in when I mentioned that something was wrong with Jake. She rushed upstairs and I tried to get him to snap out of it, but again he didn't respond. I dialed the police, telling them about both Jake and the apparently missing Ethan. Again, I don't know how much sense I made on the phone, but the lady eventually confirmed that officers were on their way. I told them to send an ambulance too, before hanging up and returning to Jake and my mom. The cops arrived a little while later, and my mom and I met them at the door on the brink of utter hysteria. We led them inside and tried to explain what was happening as an ambulance pulled up on the road behind the cruiser. Once again, I doubted if they could make heads or tails of what we were telling them. My mom's priority was obviously Jake, but before she could lead them or the EMTs upstairs, something truly unpredictable happened. I was trying to tell one cop what had happened, when something large struck the other cop hard out of the corner of my eye. The impact caused us all to collapse. When I looked back up, I saw Jake, who had apparently just leapt from the second floor window on top of the cop. Without a word, he began to beat the officer mercilessly, driving his fists into the poor guy's face again and again with vicious intent or bearing an expression that seemed utterly devoid of either empathy or humanity. The other cop quickly regained his footing and tackled Jake off his partner. They wrestled around for a moment as mom cried and begged both of them to stop. I stepped in as well, helping the officer subdue my brother as tears stung my eyes. I didn't understand what was even happening. The two of us eventually managed to restrain Jake, but the damage had been done. The officer he attacked was an older guy, and his face looked like he had just sparred with Manny Pacquiao and Mike Tyson at the same time. The EMTs rushed in to help, and more cops soon arrived unseen. I just held my mom as she cried. Jake has never been a violent person, and I don't understand what possessed him to suddenly attack that cop like that. He really did a number on that man too, and he's still in a coma. They're not sure he'll ever recover. Jake was taken to jail, and he has yet to say a single word to anyone since the brutal attack. It's like he's still in a trance, almost like his mind is being controlled. Over the next few days, my mom, dad and I were interviewed by the cops several times. My story was obviously not taken seriously at first, but I didn't know what else to say. I showed them my videos on TikTok and how other users seemed to have been witnessing the same phenomenon. They really seemed to grow nervous at that point. I mean, a paranormal explanation for a police assault is just about the dumbest possible excuse someone could make, right? No one in their right mind would believe it, but it was all I could tell them. One of the interrogators said that they were going to contact a special investigation unit and they would come to our house to interview us a few days later. I don't think I slept at all during that time. I kept hearing voices and thinking I saw shadows in my room. Obviously, the things that have happened in the last little bit have done a number on my mental health, and not sleeping has obviously exasperated that. But I know there's more to it than that. The special investigation unit finally knocked on the door, and they looked about as generic as I expected them to. Two men, black suits, with heads utterly devoid of hair of any kind, even lacking eyebrows. The way they spoke was almost... robotic. It's hard to explain, but I assumed they were FBI or CIA, despite them never actually stating who they worked for. They told us we needed to leave our house or they conducted an investigation. We were too exhausted to argue by that point, and we simply packed our things and drove to a local hotel with Truffles and Lemmy in tow. We've been here almost three weeks now, and we still have very few answers. Jake is facing a charge of first-degree assault on a police officer whom remains in critical condition. Ethan's whereabouts are still unknown, and no one has heard from him. His bank account hasn't been touched, and his phone hasn't been used. I tried to call him more, but his phone just goes straight to voicemail now. It makes me shudder to think where he is, or what he's doing. If you happen to see a guy with curly brown hair, about 6'1", heavyset with glasses who responds to the name Ethan, stay away from him. 
I don't think he can be trusted anymore. Of course, it came out in the news a little while later that the United States government intends to ban TikTok, citing national security concerns. Maybe that's actually true, but I can't help but think there's something much worse at play here. This is all my fault, and I know that now. All I can do is ruminate all the things that have happened lately, and I think I've learned a few things. The nightmares I had, and the response from the Ouija board. That single word that keeps coming back to me. Paravotel. Spread or disperse. The video from that other girl on TikTok who said, I'm ready. It's truly worrying to me now. I think that's what this thing, this Osira wants. To spread and grow her influence. I think TikTok became the medium for her to do just that. And I think I let her out. It all started with me. And... I am so very sorry for how ridiculously stupid I've been. I know my words are hollow, but I don't know what else to do. I don't think Osira is a demon. I think she's something else entirely. For all I know, she's some eldritch abomination hell-bent on devouring our planet. I keep having dreams about her. About war, devastation and pandemonium of all kinds. She is chaos madness, discord and debauchery. Just look around at the state of the world right now. I'd say her influence is already being felt. I don't know where we go from here, but if I were you, I would avoid those videos like the plague if they're still out there. She may just choose you next. Either way, a rogue deity of chaos invading the planet through the internet sounds like the most 2020 thing to happen all year. Be safe, everyone. Bad things are on the horizon. <laughs>